Hi guys, coming to you in one take because I don't know how to edit videos. Um, I'm Reagan, hi. Um, we're in my bedroom, um, which is messy, so this is all that you will see. Um, but please feel free to peep the many stupid photos that I have back here. Um, there are some gems in there, <laughs> so maybe you'll catch one of me being real ugly. Um, anyway, okay, so I'm here today to talk to you guys about On the Road by Jack Kerak. Um, and honestly, if I'm not saying his name right, I want to apologize because I don't know what's going on half the time, <laughs> so I don't know how to say his name. Um, anyway, so Jack Kerak, he was born in 1922, um, died in 1969, which means that he was 47 um, when he died. Um, and actually, his story reminded me a lot of Hemingway, not his story like on the road, but his personal story. Uh, actually, just the fact that he was a raging alcoholic. Um and he was bitter about everything um so yeah pretty Hemingway but I mean that bitterness seemed kind of fair um because you know Hemingway was part of the lost generation or whatever um which is the generation that came between the two wars um so they were pretty um lost wow <laughs> pretty fitting name for that generation huh um but anyway Kirak wasn't born between the two wars um he was born in 22 which means that he wasn't even born when the First World War ended, and then he was in his late teens, early 20s, when the Second World War started and ended. Um, but that being said, he definitely does have that sort of cynicism that came with being um, in your formative years during a war. Um, so he actually called this style of cynicism being beat, um, or maybe that was an adjective, so it wouldn't have... He... Anyway, um... <laughs> Um, but he used it to refer to the people whose voices were often heard, so like artists and writers and um, intellectuals, um, and they were beat because um, they had been disaffected by war. Um, and along with this beat style, Kirak perfected this idea of prose that he called spontaneous prose, um, which basically meant that he didn't want any type of regulation or parameters on what he could and couldn't write. Um, it was a pre pretty freewheeling and languid style of writing that um, the Norton says is reminiscent of jazz. Um, I don't listen to a whole lot of jazz, so I will take its word on that. Um, his biography also says, The practice of spontaneous poetry sought to eliminate the gap between thought and word, between experience and voice, between life and art. Um, so this spontaneous prose is a pretty obvious move away from modernism, um, which was still pretty prevalent in that time period. Um, but, so just hold on to that idea, I'm going back to it. Um, so on the road, it follows this guy whose name is Sal. Um, he's supposedly a mirror to Kirak himself, um, and his best friend Dean, who is um, a fictional representation and manifestation of a lot of things. Um, the first is that he's a fictionalization of the real person, Neil Cassidy, who, if you don't know, was a character. Um, I will put a link in the bio or in the description below um, if you want to check him out. And if not, that's fine. Whatever. Um, but I'm here to talk about Dean. Um, and for the record, if any of you watch Supernatural, I am struggling so much to say Sal and Dean instead of Sam and Dean because... Um, anyway, so if I accidentally say Sam and Dean, please know that I mean Sal. <laughs> um, okay, so Sal and Dean are best buds in On the Road, um, and we've only got the first and last chapters in the anthology, so I don't really know the whole picture, but from what I gather, they go on this road trip, um, which is, you know, where the title comes from. Um, but that actually doesn't seem as important as who Dean becomes on this road trip, or who he was versus who he is after this road trip. Um, so as I said, he, Dean is a manifestation of a lot of things. Um, aside from him being Neil Cassidy, he also seems to be a manifestation of spontaneous prose in and of itself. Or rather, spontaneous prose um, is a manifestation of Neil Cassidy. Um, Neil Cassidy was the one who inspired Kirak to create spontaneous prose as an idea, um, as the style of writing. So Neil and Dean are actually a pull away from this modernism. They are the pull away from this modernism. Um, so you've got this modernist style on one side, and Dean on the other, who is uneducated but still has a shining intellect, um, who is also quite unapologetically a con man, um, but who also is just so, so full of joy for life. Um, I want to read you a section real quick. I think it's kind of important. Okay, so, um, but Dean's intelligence 
was every bit as formal and shining and complete without the tedious intellectualness, and his criminality was not something that sulked and sneered. It was a wild yea-saying overburst of American joy. It was Western, a long a coming. He only stole cars for joy rides. Um, besides, all my New York friends are in their negative, nightmare position of putting down society and giving their tired, bookish, or political, or psychoanalytical reasons. But Dean just raced in society, eager for bread and love. He didn't care one way or the other. Um, a term that Kerak actually uses a little bit later on is hunger, which I thought was a really interesting idea. Um, like, Dean was hungry to experience life in that free-willing, unhindered way of his. Which brings me to the last thing that I want to talk about. Um, so Dean also seemed to me to be an exploration to the transient nature of joy. Um, and let me know how pretentious that made me sound. Um, no, but like I said, um, we've only got the first and last chapters in this anthology. So um, I'm sure that this shift wasn't so stark reading the whole book that I only read the first and last chapters. Um, but so just reading those, you couldn't help but notice how different Dean in the first chapter was from Dean to the last chapter. Um, he was truly beat um, in the last chapter. He had this vivaciousness in the first part, and in the second, he just seemed so lost. Um, even though he was still doing exactly what he'd always done, you know, he didn't have any rules or regulations. He was doing exactly what he wanted to do. Um, and he still just kind of felt sad to me, you know. Um, so the moral of the story seems to be that even if you do exactly what you want every day of your life, you'll still end up miserable. So what a cheery note to end on. Okay, bye guys. <laughs>